Hi there, my name is John Martin, and today I'd like to talk to you about a new gravity model we've been working on at CU. So the, the general research story behind this project uh, started because I was curious about why spherical harmonics has become this de facto standard gravity model within astrodynamics. Um, so I, I took a moment and tried to write down what I see as some of the pros and, and cons of this gravity model. So in terms of pros, one of the great things about spherical harmonics is it's derived from first principles. So it is one of the few analytic solutions we have to the differential equation, which is Laplace's equation. And uh, the other really good thing about spherical harmonics is it's just frustratingly good at capturing planetary oblateness. So most um, planets and moons will have this, this kind of pudginess at their equator. Spherical harmonics, excellent at capturing this. But some of the disadvantages with, with spherical max really come when you look at everything past J2. And I try and illustrate that uh, in this figure on the right. So we have planetary oblateness for the Earth uh, shown above. And then as soon as we strip that away and look at what remains, we have things like mountain ranges. So things like the Andes, the Himalayas, some boundaries between tectonic plates. And these things are, are far more discontinuous and require sometimes hundreds of thousands of harmonics superimposed together before you can produce something that looks anything like a mountain. Um, and in order to do this, you need to regress these really high frequencies, which decay rapidly. So they're really hard to, to, to observe. And you have to be careful about where you sample in your gravity field to make sure you're not aliasing the wrong frequency. Then in small body exploration, this model can actually entirely break down as soon as you enter that bounding sphere. And there are intrinsic computational limitations where you have the associated Legendre polynomials that have to be recur uh, computed recursively. That no way to parallelize. So an admittedly somewhat biased portrayal, there seem to be more cons that there are pros for this gravity model. So one of the questions I got really interested in with my, my PhD was, you know, are there better basis functions to represent these complicated gravity fields? And to answer this, I turned to tools like machine learning and neural networks. So what if there was a way to train a neural network uh, by taking some position inputs and mapping to an acceleration and calling that a gravity model? Um, I, I do not mean to take credit for this idea. People before me had approached the problem in this way. And, and there are some advantages and some drawbacks. So uh, one of the perks of this approach is we're suddenly free of all of these analytic limitations. We're, we're not trying to you know, fit a mountain range with sines and cosines anymore. Uh, but the, the drawbacks of this choice is that you know, we, we suddenly lose all of these analytic guarantees. So, you know, we can't guarantee that this neural network is a solution to Laplace's equation. Uh, neural networks are also typically quite inefficient to train, you need lots of data. And even once trained, they, they can uh, perform poorly as soon as you leave the bounds of that training data. They don't extrapolate very well. So, you know, solve some problems, introduce others. And one of the things I was really curious about is I liked the idea of this, this solution. Um, so are there any ways we can kind of massage some of these, these drawbacks such that we end up with more benefits than the disadvantages? And one of the, the quick ways to, to improve the performance of this solution is use something called a physics-informed neural network. So we talked about spherical harmonics being great because it's a solution to Laplace's equation. But what if we just add Laplace's equation to the cost function of a traditional neural network? And this is the, the transition between a traditional and physics-informed neural network. Is physics-informed neural networks take all of these dynamic constraints and, and physics, include them in the cost function, and uh, in this way, force that whatever solution your neural network learns it has to naturally comply with all of these important properties. And there's a lot of advantages to this approach, tons of literature about it. Uh, but as soon as I read this paper, I said, we have to try this on a gravity modeling problem. So uh, this kind of produced the first generation of the physics informed neural network or PIN gravity model. And the idea is we have a cost function that's trying to minimize this differential equation, that your acceleration is the negative gradient of the potential. And what we do is we train a neural network that says, all right, here's some position data. Let's map to a potential function and use automatic differentiation to compute a derivative, or excuse me, uh, the acceleration. And we compare the predicted acceleration with the true acceleration and call that our loss. And immediately there are some really cool uh, you know, improvements. So to show this, we look at the true gravity field of Earth above J2. And I run a test where I, I give spherical harmonics 3,000 coefficients to try and reproduce this field as accurately as possible. This is what it gives us. I'm the exact same experiment with a physics informed neural network gravity model. And I say, you have 3,000 weights and biases, you know, do your best. And, and really you can see that there's, there's no competition between these two gravity models. 
The thin gravity model immediately recognizes the most important parts of the problem and models accordingly. Whereas spherical harmonics still doesn't quite know what's going on. It, it just needs more harmonics to be able to capture those features. Pins are also ridiculously fast um, in comparison to things like spherical harmonics and the polyhedral model. So, you know, taking together a more accurate model that runs faster, you know, what's there to lose? Well, um, there were admittedly a fair number of, of problems with this early generation model. The more we stress tested it, the more we realized that there are these challenges that needed to be addressed before this could really become kind of an industry standard. So we list some of these problems here. We spent another four months kind of chipping away at the problem and we solved three of them with the second generation pin gravity model two. But that left us still with issues like these networks didn't extrapolate very well. They had numerical instabilities and um, they had somewhat inconsistent performance at different altitudes. So, you know, the progression was pin gravity model one uh, in early 2020, some exciting initial findings, but a lot of drawbacks. Pin gravity model two solving some of them in mid 2022. And uh, today we'd like to introduce pin gravity model three, um, which tries to solve all of the remaining issues that pin gravity model two wasn't able to, to figure out. So there are eight different changes in this model. Uh, we only have time for three of them. So if you're interested, I, I encourage you to check out the paper. But we're gonna start back here uh, with the cost function. So pin gravity model one was trained with the mean squared error loss function. So we're trying to minimize the, the difference between the predicted acceleration and the true acceleration. Uh, and, and while this is a really popular cost function for most regression problems in machine learning, it doesn't really uh, work as well for the gravity modeling problem. And the reason for this is accelerations at the surface of any body at low altitudes are always gonna appear so much larger than accelerations at high altitudes. So even if you have a, a small error near the surface, that error is going to look orders of magnitude larger than if you had a prediction at high altitudes that was entirely wrong. And so your neural network is always gonna have a preference for these low altitude samples. And you can see this. So if you look, instead of at the, the mean squared error as a function of altitude, we look at the percent error. You can see that the neural network produces uh, quite accurate predictions really close to the body. But as soon as you move to these higher altitudes, it starts producing uh, predictions that are, you know, 100% erroneous. So we can't have this. You know, we fly at these high altitudes. We don't want our, our, you know, gravity model to produce a vector pointing in the entirely wrong direction, right? So how do we change this? Uh, well, let's just switch our cost function to use mean percent error instead. And now it doesn't matter if you're at high or low altitudes. It just matters if it's producing an incorrect uh, prediction. Let's try and minimize that regardless of its absolute magnitude. So we take a, uh, an error profile that looks like this um, to one that looks like this. That's much more steady state, regardless of your altitude. Um, interestingly, by, by switching to this percent error cost function, we also get better performance in mean squared error, root mean squared error. Uh, but if you have a scrutinizing eye, you realize that there's something kind of um, funky going on with the figure on the right. Namely that after about 12 radii, the error seems to plateau. So what's going on? Well, this has to do with uh, numerical error. You know, these neural networks are typically trained with 32-bit floats, and there comes a point where we're trying to produce values that are so small, it just clips them and calls them zero. Just the numerics of the network are sort of ill-conditioned. And again, this just has to do with the fact that potentials and accelerations naturally decay. Um, they decay in a predictable error, though, which we can leverage. So uh, again, you're just trying to produce values that, you know, are close to, to one or negative one near the surface. But as you move to these higher altitudes, we're talking 10 to the negative nine, negative 20. Um, and, and your neural network just performs, it, it loses its nice conditioning in the numerics when you go to those altitudes. So how do we fix this? Um, is there any way we could actually learn a distribution that was a little bit more numerically um, favorable? And, and the answer is yes. Let's let's actually learn a scale invariant form of the potential. And we know that that potential should decay according to a pattern of one over R to the P uh, based on some factors. So we can later in the model, take this distribution that's numerically well conditioned and compress it into the correct order of magnitude uh, for that altitude. So that's exactly what we do. If we, if we learn the potential directly, we clearly have this, this numerical plateau but if we learn a scale invariant form of the potential, uh, you can see we can go up to, to altitudes um, that far exceed the bounds of the training data. We're talking 150 times the radius of the body and, and even higher with uh, numerical conditioning that remains stable. So solve two of the, the three problems I listed. The third one has to do with extrapolation error. So uh, 
neural networks perform really well inside the bounds of the training data as shown here. Uh, but as soon as you leave that training data kind of area, you can see the network predictions uh, blow up, entirely diverge. So how do, we, how do we solve this problem? Well, we can leverage information about the boundary conditions of these differential equations. So we know potential should decay to zero at an infinite radius away from the body. Um, so is there maybe a way we can you know, have two knobs where one knob decreases the influence of the neural network solution and the other knob increases the, the enforcement of this boundary condition as you increase in altitude? So uh, the answer is yes. So we can use things like heavy side functions or smoother flavors like hyperbolic tangents uh, to, to do exactly that, to, to turn the knob down on the neural network and turn the knob up with the boundary condition through this equation. Um, but you'll say, well, you know, a boundary condition of uh, the potential is at zero at infinite radii away, isn't that helpful? Because it basically tells the neural network that it's responsible for modeling all the way up to infinity. And that's not really easing its burden. So um, is there any better boundary condition we can use? And uh, we can actually turn to things like spherical harmonics to answer that question. So we know uh, that the high order frequencies of spherical harmonics decay to zero uh, at high altitudes. And you're left with a point mass approximation. So what if we call a point mass approximation our, our boundary condition? And again, you know, decrease the neural network and increase the point mass model and in this way enforce the proper uh, behavior at these extremely high altitudes. So that's what we do. And, and to show this, we look at the error as a function of altitude for the second generation pin gravity model and the third generation green. And you can see as soon as we leave the bounds of the training data at three radii, Pin gravity model two immediately diverges, whereas pin gravity model three stays at a nice, comfortable 100th of percent error all the way out to infinity. So just to show what this looks like for that original figure, you can see uh, regardless of the fact that we trained only out to three radii, as soon as we move to higher altitudes, things remain well-conditioned all the way out to infinity. And I think this is a really you know, important development for these machine learning gravity models, which show that they uh, aren't just useful locally, but they can actually be used globally. Um, you can trust them out to infinity and guarantee that they're going to be no worse than a point mass model uh, approximation. So uh, I've had time to talk about three of these eight changes. I, I leave you with this slide to kind of um, entice you to check out the paper. There's some other really interesting changes that we introduced to solve different problems. Um, but uh, I kind of want to skip to the upshot. So, you know, we have this new gravity model, this third generation. How much better is it than its predecessors? And I try and show that with this figure here on the right. So. But what I do is I train networks of increasingly um, high capacity. So, so neural networks that are somewhat weak and don't have many weights and biases. Uh, and as you move to the right, networks that have a lot of parameters and are generally quite powerful networks. And I look specifically at what happens as you increase the amount of training data you need and amount of training time. And what you see is for the, the first generation pin gravity model, the low capacity networks almost never learn anything useful. Uh, once you start getting into these more powerful networks, there are some cases where it begins to learn some interesting features, uh, but performance is somewhat inconsistent, like we were talking about before. Whereas for the pin gravity model three, it doesn't matter if you have a very weak network or an extremely powerful network. It always learns something interesting about your gravity field. Uh, and better yet, the networks behave exactly as you would expect. So the more training data you add, the better they do. The longer you train, the better they do. Uh, in cases where you have too little data and you train for too long, they might begin overfitting, but this is trivially remedied with things like dropout or adding additional physics and constraints. So I think this is a, a great tell of a well-designed uh, machine learning system is that it changes, uh, its performance changes exactly as you'd expect as you vary the different hyperparameters and how they would typically affect a network. So I've introduced this new gravity model. Um, why should everyone else care? Um, and I argue it's that all problems within astrodynamics really rely at, with, uh, at, a, at a gravity model at its core. And you know we're beginning to explore how we can drop in pin gravity models in place of point mass approximation, polyhedral models, spherical harmonic models in, in areas of filtering and estimation, and reinforcement learning, and orbit discovery. Uh, but I think, I think any problem with astrodynamics um, can benefit from this new gravity model. And we really would really love for you to, to consider um, looking at it for your own applications. So uh, with that, I'll leave you with uh, the GitHub link to the repository with all the code to train these models. You can of course reach out to me via email, um, but with that, I'll kind of leave you with the concluding remarks of, I, I think the pin gravity model is a really exciting uh, way to solve the gravity modeling problem. And I think this generation three adds the, the last necessary layer of robustness, of robustness uh, for 
uh, long-term use within the community. So if you're interested, uh, again, please feel free to check it out or, or reach out if you have any questions. Thank you.